Harvard, Yale, Pennsylvania, Cornell, Columbia, Princeton. They're all part of the select club of the best universities in the world. And guess what? They're all American. The United States has the best universities on the planet. And no, it's not just us saying that. The Shanghai Academic Ranking, which is the most important study in charge of evaluating the level of universities in depth, places 15 American universities among the 20 best in the world. Yes, that's right, 15 out of 20. And yes, I know what some of you are thinking. Since the United States is a large, rich, and populous country, it is completely logical that it has the best universities. Well, this is partly true, but it does not fully explain their success. If it were the size of the country, China or India would dominate the ranking. Or if, on the other hand, it were the country's income that was the determining factor, Germany would have to be close to the United States. And yet, this is not the case. But let's stay for a moment with the case of Germany, or rather, Europe as a whole. It turns out that over the years, European countries have lost a lot of ground in terms of universities compared to the United States. But even universities in other countries such as Singapore and South Korea are beginning to enjoy more prestige than European universities. Basically, the world's best professors and experts no longer want to work in Europe, and the best European students decide to move to the United States to study at American universities. In other words, Europe today is unable to retain its own talent, which is precisely why it is in severe decline. But if you don't believe me, let me give you a more concrete example. Look at the Nobel Prizes. It is not only that most of the prize winners are American, but also that when they give their thank you speech, they always emphasize their wonderful and fruitful time at an American university, something that hardly ever happens with European universities. Therefore, the questions here are very clear. Why does the USA have the best universities in the world? Why is Europe experiencing a complete university decline? Today on Visual Economic, we tell you all about it. But before we continue, did you know that more than 1.2 million unwanted calls have been made this year to the United States alone? The most disturbing fact is that one third of them all were imposter calls involving scammers impersonating agencies. But there is no need yet to panic, or at least not to take as a given. The good news is that you have the right to protect your privacy by asking data brokers to remove the information they have about you. The bad news is that it would take you years to do it manually. But wait, because all is not lost. Incogni, today's sponsor, will help you solve this problem in three easy steps. First, create an account and tell Incogni whose personal data they'll be removing. Second, grant Incogni the rights to work for you. They'll contact the data brokers and request the deletion of your personal data. Third, sit back and relax. Incogni will handle any objections and keep you updated on their progress every step of the way. And the best part, the first 100 people to use the code ECONOMICEN at the link below will receive a 60% discount on Incogni. Don't miss this chance to protect your privacy. Before beginning to analyze the problems of the European university, one thing must be made very clear. Up until the turn of the 20th century, European universities were the undisputed world leaders. I don't know if you've seen the Oppenheimer movie, but many American scientists like him migrated to Europe in order to be trained in the best universities in Germany or the United Kingdom. And we need not go far to find other examples of great scientists like Einstein, Bohr, or Fermi. All of them also passed through European universities at some some stage. Europe was the destination of the academic elite par excellence. However, things changed little by little. The US started to become an increasingly wealthy place. Its productive system was crying out for highly skilled technological workers to develop and manage its huge industrial and business conglomerate. And with that came the great opportunity for the universities. They had to be in charge of training the best students to achieve this economic development. American private universities began to attract talent, paying a very high salaries and providing professors with unbeatable infrastructure for their work. Laboratories, libraries, the first computers, endless possibilities. And of course, at the same time that American universities were getting better and better, the opposite was true in Europe. regulation and bureaucracy so typical in Europe made it very difficult to hire and keep good teachers. For example, European universities have little autonomy in choosing the salaries they pay. Usually it is the government of the day that decides how much professors will earn. So what's the problem? The problem is that Europe cannot compete with American universities in terms of salaries. Keep in mind that in the US, many professors earn hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. That is something that would simply be politically unfeasible in several European 
European countries. But it is no longer a question of salary. Another very important factor is how teachers are paid. In the US, salaries are usually highly dependent on the performance of each professor. In other words, the better the attention of students, the greater the number of scientific articles published. And the higher the quality of the articles, the more the professors are paid. Yet, this reward mechanism is much weaker in Europe. It is true that there is a portion of the salary that depends on performance, but it is much lower than in the United States. In other words, in Europe, the salary differences between a good teacher and a bad teacher are not that big. So, as you can probably imagine, that discourages teachers from trying to be the best. However, the European University has a lot more problems than just salaries. In Europe, there is one big problem. The teaching staff are very, very fixed. It is very difficult to hire and fire workers. And that is a problem for two reasons. Firstly, because if a teacher with a public position performs badly, it is practically impossible to fire him or her. Public employment positions are practically indestructible. And that means that teachers have no pressure to do their job well. But how many times have you had to deal with incompetent teachers who do not suffer any consequences for it? I'm sure that those of you who are watching us from Europe know a a lot of cases, so that's how it is. Meanwhile, in the US, they can fire much more easily and incompetent people usually end up leaving. However, the problem with fixed faculty staff is not only in the incentives. For example, think about technological change. With the rise of modern technology, many careers such as computer science have been gaining ground in the professional world. At the same time, other careers such as philosophy and the arts have plummeted. In other words, more and more engineers are needed while fewer philosophers and artists are required. Universities should therefore adjust their educational offerings accordingly. And this is something that the US has understood very well. For almost 15 years now, universities have been offering fewer and fewer places in non-scientific or technical degrees that don't offer much of a job future, and they are focusing, above all, on the more technological areas. Nevertheless, in Europe, or at least in many European countries, universities are not able to adapt to this new professional reality. For example, look at Spain, a particularly distressing case. Despite the technology boom, fewer and fewer places are being offered in engineering degrees, yet the arts and humanities are the fastest growing. Yes, it is ridiculous, just the opposite of what is happening in the USA. It's no reason that Spain is one of the countries with the least innovation and productive research in Europe, right? But why is this happening? Well, again, one important clause, but not the only one, is that the staffing levels are fixed. It is difficult to hire new professors to expand the number of places in new degrees, and it is almost impossible to lay off staff in degrees that are no longer needed. Conclusion, the university is disconnected from the professional reality. But that's not the worst of it. Beyond the problem of rigid workforces, another important issue is that of personnel selection. Take a look. Universities cannot hire whoever they want, whenever they want, but must follow a series of bureaucratic criteria when doing so. And what do these criteria depend on? Well, usually they come from government agencies in charge of evaluating the merits of candidates for public positions. These agencies typically give value to the number of scientific publications. That is, the more a doctorate level candidate has published, the more points he or she will have to gain access to a public position in a university. So what's the problem, you may ask? The problem is that quantity does not equal quality. Not all scientific studies are the same. Some are very meticulously developed, with novel and revolutionary results. Meanwhile, others have neither the level, nor the impact, nor the guarantees of the previous ones. The issue is that assessment agencies give priority to the quantity of studies rather than the quality, and that means that researchers do not make an effort to publish quality articles, but simply spend the day publishing mediocre studies like hotcakes. And not surprisingly, as a consequence, the the overall quality of the university plummets. However, an even better known problem with these agencies is that they allow what is known as university inbreeding. That is, becoming a professor at the same university where you trained. 
In this way, a student could befriend the professors and have privileges when it comes to being hired at the end of his or her studies. In other words, there's a cronyism that puts personal relationships, favoritism, and clientelism ahead of the merits of each candidate. This hinders the arrival of talent from other places and healthy labor competition. University inbreeding is so widespread that in many places such as Spain, Belgium, and Sweden, it exceeds 50%. While, for example, in the United Kingdom, which is the exception, with great universities such as Oxford or Cambridge, it barely reaches 10%. In any case, visual economic community, the problems of the European model are not only with the teachers. One thing that makes US universities very different from European universities is the freedom of students to choose which subjects to take and to adapt their university curricula. In other words, no matter how multidisciplinary a student's interests are and how much he or she wants to expand his or her knowledge beyond the usual program, this will not be possible in Europe, where the degree will be directed from beginning to end by governments and universities. Come to think of it, it would actually make more sense to establish a system in which the student has flexibility in choosing the subjects, or at least a good part of them. But guess what? In order to implement this more flexible model, something fundamental is needed. Money. Spending on education per student is much lower in most European countries than in the US, and there is a very strong correlation with the university quality. The higher the expenditure, the higher the quality, according to the Shanghai Index. And you may be wondering, what is the reason for this lack of resources? <laughs> Basically, university fees are not as high as in the United States. In other words, it is much cheaper to go to university in Europe than in the United States. And while this is advantageous on the one hand, there is a trade-off in that universities do not get enough revenue to provide scholarships to the brightest students, to hire the best professors, and to have the best facilities, or to fund major research projects. On top of all that, another problem with the European university is that it tends to have too many students. Yes, that's right, too many students. Already scarce university resources are spread among many, many students, which ultimately reduces the attention devoted to each student. Precisely because of this, we see that the size of universities negatively affect students' performance. It's as if the faculties are mass-producing degrees, instead of conscientiously dedicating themselves to each of their students. Be that as it may, and having seen some of the many problems of universities in Europe, it is now time to ask ourselves, what has the United States done to avoid all these problems and become the global elite for universities? Well, let's take a look. From Harvard to heaven. The fundamental characteristic of the best American universities is that they operate like high-level companies. That is, the criteria of efficiency and excellence are sacrosanct. But don't think that this applies only to private universities. In fact, state universities also follow this way of working to some extent, enjoying much more flexibility and autonomy than European universities. In other words, the US federal government does not have much say in university decision-making, so most universities can choose the staff they want, pay the salaries they see fit, charge the fees they see fit, and ultimately choose how they will carry out their teaching and research. And keep in mind that this is not just a random idea. Those universities that have more freedom and act with a certain degree of independence from the government of the day are capable of producing many more patents than those that are constrained by political criteria. Of course, all this would not be possible without another fundamental factor, financing. <laughs> Unlike Europe, US universities enjoy an immense amount of resources. Just think, for example, that the annual financial endowment of Harvard University is approximately $50 billion, which is more than the GDP of Bolivia and almost the GDP of Uruguay. An absolute fortune. The question is, where does all this money come from? Well, as you can imagine, there are various sources of income. From government subsidies, to sponsorship agreements with private companies, to the university fees themselves, which are much higher than in Europe. But on top of that, there is another source that many of you will be surprised to see. Chicago Booth's PhD program receives $100 million gift in celebration of its 100th anniversary. In the United States, philanthropy is another source of income for universities. Basically, it is common that some millionaires or some companies decide to make donations as a token of appreciation to the educational system. But then again, you do remember that we told you a little while ago that elite universities operate like businesses, so that also means, just like good companies, they compete with each other. 
For example, it turns out that what are probably the two best universities in the US and the world, Harvard and MIT, are only an eight minute drive from each other. And although this may seem like an irrelevant fact, in reality, it implies a huge effort they both have to make to maintain their market share. In other words, they fight to hire the best professors and to get the best students. What's more, universities are very committed to ensuring a good professional future for their students. They collaborate with companies and promote integration between studies and the professional world. Without going any further, there is a very strong correlation between the creation of startups and the areas where the best universities are located. Startups in 183 regions shows that top university researchers in a region contribute to firm formation. As if all this were not enough, perhaps the last major difference between the US and Europe is the winning horse strategy. You see, American universities typically select their best students, create elite clubs, and train them very intensively. In fact, they even go so far as to invest enormous amounts of money so that they eventually become the best professionals in the world. Not to mention the fact that the university system itself already assigns the students with the greatest potential to very high-level universities. In other words, going to Harvard is not the same as going to any other university. The best go to Harvard, but because only the best go, Harvard is able to to offer advanced classes that would not be possible for less advanced students. In other words, the US creates an unequal university system that allows it to extract every last drop of potential from the best students. The most selective universities spend about $150,000 per student, about six times the US average and about 15 times as much as their less well-heeled counterparts. The American system is well suited to producing top schools, although at the cost of inequality. Having seen all this, it's now your turn. What do you think of the differences between the European and American models? Do you agree with the inequality of US universities? Do you think that the financing of European universities should be changed? You can leave your answers in the comments. And if you like this video, subscribe, like it, and as always, we'll see you in the next video. All the best. See you soon.